So, uh, welcome to this afternoon's session in which we'll be uh, looking at player contracts, but we won't only be looking at player contracts. We'll be doing it in, uh, in conjunction with, we're taking quite a wide interpretation and looking at the broader sort of transfer system and the various parties that have got interest within that system. So, on the panel, we have a distinguished lineup of speakers who have uh, represent various stakeholders within the football profession. We have Alexandra Gomez from uh, Thief Pro, who is their legal counsel. Everyone knows who Thief Pro are, I presume, the, the player association for professional footballers, football players around the world. To her left, we have uh, Daniel Cravo, who many of you will be familiar with from previous Soccer X uh, events all over the world that he's spoken at. Um, Daniel is a, a sports lawyer. He represents not only uh, clubs in Brazil, but also players on, the, on uh, an international level. And to his left, we have Ian Lynham, who's the co-head of sport at uh, Charles Russell Speechleys. He is a sports lawyer. He works not only on uh, player contracts, but also more broadly on uh, commercial and corporate deals within sport and uh, has quite a wide practice uh, and looks into integrity matters as well. And to his left, we have Daniel Lorenz, who, again, many of you will know, who have been to Soccer X on multiple occasions, who is the former legal uh, head of legal, sorry, FC Porto, and uh, a leading sports lawyer. So the title of the session, and I'm gonna, uh, no doubt it's going to be debated, <laughs> um, is player contracts. Do, how much do they protect, uh, or how much protection do they offer the players? So to start off with, I thought it would be good if each of you could just give your opinion on how effective on a... And I think it may be good to give a, both a domestic and international perspective because you'll have your unique opinions. How much protection does actually a player contract offer the player? And I think I'll start with, to get the ball rolling, uh, uh, Alexandra. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, I think that actually it's uh, not a sufficient protection that the contracts uh, provide to players. Uh, for a number of reasons, um, I think that uh, the numbers show um, the justification for what I'm saying. Uh, we have uh, carried out a research in FIFPRO um, that it's called the um, labor market research. And in that uh, research, uh, we found out that 41% uh, of the players were having overdue payments. So how can we say that the contracts are protecting the players if almost half of these players are not receiving their, their monies on time, right? On top of this, we have a lot of claims uh, of international uh, dimension in the DRC. 85% of these uh, claims are from the players and most of them, uh, the vast majority, I think it's like 95%, are won by the players. So it shows that they are right to lodge these claims. Whereas only 15% are lodged by the clubs and half are fully rejected. Uh, so I think that that really shows the situation of, uh, of the, the players. Another um, issue is the, the registration, for example. Um, play, the player may terminate his contract uh, with just cause even, but if it's outside the transfer window, in most of the countries he will not be able to register. So, sorry, for those, I'm going to assume that there's uh, uh, a little knowledge in the room, but just for the, on some of the legal points, um, if you're not sure, please raise your hand up if you have a question throughout, but can you just clarify the just cause part, because I know we talk about it in the sports law circles, but for those, some people may be less familiar with that. Okay, uh, well, when it's without just cause, it could be like there's the player just leaves. You know, he has a, a, a contract for a certain uh, period of time and he just leaves. When it's with uh, just cause, it could be because of non-payment, but uh, the jurisprudence has developed this theory that it has to be three months of non-payment. Sometimes it's less, but uh, generally it's three months. Or there could be other uh, situations like training alone or other stuff, but it really has to be very well proven uh, for a player to be able to leave his club uh, without having to pay a very uh, hard and unknown compensation. Oh, and that leads me to another point, that for the players it's really difficult to know, or even impossible, I would say, due to the jurisprudence that has developed, to know if he breaches his contract, if he says, like, okay, I don't want to play here anymore and I'm leaving, to know how much he will have to pay to the club as compensation. Whereas for the club, 
it's very clear because it's the rest value of the contract of the player. And that, is, that would be like the maximum because the, the new contract of the player, the amount is going to be deducted from that. So, so it so could lead to nothing. So, so from, from your perspective, uh, and I'll, so basically you're saying that the contract doesn't often or doesn't at times offer much protection to the player. Exactly. Uh, but from that, from that, the number that you gave, which is quite a sort of large number, was that particularly geo-specific? So was that sort of outside of Europe? Um, you know, whether because there are overdue payable rules, and maybe in you maybe but want in to Europe, the in, in Europe, the same number that I was talking about, the forty-one percent, is thirty-two point two. So it's quite uh, high anyway. So Ian, uh, I'll come to you. I'll cut down. I'll come back to you in a second. But Ian, I know you have particular views on. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's, it's you know it's such a broad question, and obviously FIFA have to look at it from a very you know global in, in a whole market perspective but, but it's it, so can you hear can you hear it's not a bad thing no anyone know to turn that on yeah i think it's can on. You can, can, you it's on? can you hear me yeah, yeah. okay um yeah, so i mean it, it is hard to to generalize about um that question because i think it is different in in market to market and country to country um and across you know, a range of issues. So on the overdue payables, I mean, certainly UEFA's enhanced licensing system has had an impact um, in, in you know, um, the major European countries, but also there's nation by nation licensing as well. So you know, some countries have, will go beyond even what, what, what UEFA requires. Some countries, you know, especially outside Europe, will have no licensing system. Um, so overdue payables definitely, I think, differs you know, market to market. And, and that's true on a number of issues. So another, I suppose, key point about uh, specifically on that question, do contracts protect players, is what happens when a player gets injured? And there is a massive um, you know, disparity of, of treatment as between contracts in different countries. You know, in, I think, the Netherlands, where, where FIFA Pro are located, I think the contracts are entirely guaranteed. So you sign a four-year contract in the Netherlands, you suffer a, a serious injury, the player gets fully paid. You know, in this country, uh, players are, you know, are well protected 12 months um, if it's an, um, you know, an off-field um, incident, a, a, uh, 18 months if, if you're injured while performing your services as a footballer. But in France, you know, a big country where Neymar has just gone, for example, I was talking to you know, Michael Owen from, from Lockton Insurance, and they cover you know, players across all these different countries, and he was, you know, brought up this, this point about how different it is in these markets. You move to France, um, you suffer a career-ending injury, and, and you only get paid for 42 days. You know, if you're someone like a, you know, Neymar who's looking at such huge numbers, that makes a huge difference in a country where you get paid for 18 months and a country where you get paid for 42 days. And obviously, potentially players can go and insure that, but that can be very expensive. And particularly, if a club maybe is insuring its interest in a player, and probably they'll do that first, then it can be incredibly expensive for a player to go and source insurance because the capacity in the market has been taken up by the club. Um, so that's you know, an issue, I think, which, again, differs very much, and it's hard to be speaking in general terms about so what that should be. Well, Daniel, maybe you can bring, bring your sort of South American Brazilian perspective into this, but I think, you know, no doubt over the course of the panel, we will find out how difficult it is, particularly with international laws, uh, domestic laws, to actually have a sort of standardised approach. But can you give your perspective on it? Yeah, I, I think um, the question is not, I think, to analyse if the contract protects the player or the club, but both situations and until which extent. Of course, we're going to have always two different sides uh, contending, fighting for more rights in one side, more obligations on the other side. So we're never going to have peaceful waters in, in this, in this uh, issue. But I think that there are some improvements that are, are concrete, that are substantial. In regards to the jurisdiction of FIFA, for instance, under Article 12 b on the overdue payments, there was an improvement because the case are, are, are quickly resolved uh, instead of the ordinary procedures before the DRC. So this is an improvement, not, all, not only for the players, but also for the, for the creditors, the clubs that are creditors also. So did, I think this is something. And I think that the broader approach on that is that, of course, that the protection of a player, of a club, begins with the contract, because that's the base for the, their relationships. But it's much more than that. It's to ask if the system gives this protection and until which level for each party. For instance, um, <clears throat> and I know that Alexandra brought here, um, I think, the, the, the nuclear party of, 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 of the fifth proposition against 
the contractual stability. And when we know in that, that's, that's fair enough that we, we can openly discuss that. We'll say, if the player wants to break the contract because he has his free will and he wants to simply go to find another club, he doesn't know how much he's going to have to pay. <coughs> that's that's the, exactly the discussion of Matusalem and uh, Webster. And that's exactly the idea of contractual stability, that the player cannot make mathematics to know how much it's going to cost to be higher than simply walk away from his contract. But of course, that there is a huge discrepancy in the application of the criteria when the club is in breach and the player. And one of these distortions, for instance, we were discussing there, is the fact that the jurisprudence and the massive jurisprudence of FIFA in the CAS says that the player has to deduct his new salaries in case of a compensation, which for me is a huge mistake. Not only because it's, uh, this, there's a huge discrepancy in regards to what applies in favor of the clubs, but also because the player depends on the, so, so the path of the, the process before so, so FIFA. That's in a situation where a player, <coughs> player unilaterally terminates the contract, moves to another club, is this right? Yeah, if the player, what, what uh, Alexander was saying is that yeah. if the club, the player breached the club, uh, the contract with the club, the club knows already how much he's entitled to ask. But may I say that I don't think that's exactly accurately. Why? Because we know that these huge penal clauses that the clubs insert in the contracts, in most of the cases, unless the player is a very, very valuable player, they don't work as a pre-estimation of, of losses. No, but they the know the rest value. <coughs> that part is like safe for them. No, I know, but if the player, if I'm losing a player that simply breached the contract, I don't know how much I'm going to get from compensation. And the same works for the club that is receiving this player. He doesn't know. So it's a deterrent effect these clauses have. But they don't have the pre-liquidation of damages as we thought. So I think there are, there are some, uh, uh, some difficulties from both sides. I think the protection of the system should be discussed in many points. But we're never going to have a final agreement between clubs and so players. <coughs> so I'm going to come on to, to Daniel at the end. That, um, Yesterday we were discussing this, and so you're saying there's less of an issue with the necessary the contractual side of things, but I'll challenge that slightly, particularly with uh, agents and, and some of the issues around that, that I'd love to get your opinions on. But also, I've heard that there's multiple, there's often in certain parts of the world, there's multiple contracts. So you may have, like, you know, there might be one that's filed with the club, and then there's two other side contracts, and there might be one that sort of complies and one that doesn't so uh, comply with the regulations. Uh, can I get your sort of quick perspective on that and if uh, you've yeah. experienced that at all? Yes, and I, I, if you don't mind, I also like to comment to the first question. Well, from my experience, I've been a lawyer from a club for FC Porto for 16 years, and, but I've also doing the, the job for protecting players in, in negotiations with clubs. So I know, I know pretty well both sides. And I tend also to agree a little bit with everything that was said, but like Daniel pointed out, the basis starts with a contract. So I think if you get a, a good lawyer that knows what's, what's going on, you're pretty much protected. But of course, it depends where you're going to sign the contract. You know, uh, I think in general terms, and I understand also the, the, the fears and the, and, the, and the concerns of FIFPRO, but the player was never so protected as it is today. And if you're talking about Europe, you're pretty much protected. And you have now double licensing systems. I mean, if you want to compete in the first league and in the second league, at least in Portugal and in many countries, you have to prove that you have no debts. Now in Portugal, you even have to have no debts with your, uh, with your workers in the, in, the, in the football club or company. So it's not even the players or the, the coach. It's even the, co -work the workers. It has to do with financial fair play, but it helped, this financial fair play helped a lot the players. So then you have also the UEFA licensing. Many clubs, you have around, I don't know, 300 clubs that are competing in the European competitions. They all, if they have debts, they cannot be licensed. So you have different levels. Of course, if you are in a country, and in a country, and with, with you, you don't have licensing systems, it's different. There you have to have a good lawyer. And you will struggle more, but I, I, I think it's comparing to other sports and comparing to other professions, you're pretty much protected. Uh, coming to your question, I mean, as a lawyer, uh, when, I, when I see a, a contract, and for instance, I just saw a contract uh, 
uh, two weeks ago a player that I transferred from Portugal to, to Poland. And, and in many countries you have these bilingual uh, contracts, so you have to be sure that the English language, the language you understand, will be author authoritative, will prevail. And if you have a number of contracts, like the, the official federation or a football association contract, and then the private conditions contract, you just make sure you put a clause that in case of any dispute, the contract will prevail, the contract that has the, the, the best of the financial conditions. So this is very important. As many, I mean, in my head, I always had like, okay, let's look. Sometimes you have four pages, the other times you have 25 pages of contract. So, but try always to look, it's like to the vital points, the eyes, the mouth, the heart. It's the same as the contract. So you go to the tax questions, you go to the dispute resolution, termination uh, clauses, you go to then the, 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 the language. So you make sure that you're safe. Dispute resolution is very, very important. But then you also have little, little sub-vital sub points, as for instance, make sure that the player is signing for the first team, not the second, not the third, if they want to put them aside. So try to, to follow this, this priority list. It's a checklist, basically. And so should that be, so in the UK we've got a, um, uh, the, the player, oh, I was good. The, the, uh, we've got a standard Sound contract, point. essentially, I'll just say that. We've got a standard contract. Should we see that on a global stage where there's these minimum uh, clauses in which the, that should be adopted globally in the sense that you know, they're that important if they are? So say not everyone's privy to having such great lawyers uh, as you guys have said. But um, you know, if it is that these are the key points, should it not be negotiated and, and be as, 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 as like, that is, that is non-negotiable, then the rest we can discuss. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, let me. I remember when, when, when was it? Uh, was it uh, 13 years ago that Mourinho came from Porto to Chelsea? I remember I helped him out in the non official basis in the contract, in his employment contract. And there was this, what we were talking about, in the case he was being dismissed from the team, if he would receive all the remuneration that was established in the contract or if there was to be a mitigation with the new contract or a gardening leave, so, which is very, very typical here. Yeah. And this was not me being brilliant as a lawyer. I mean, I knew that they were paying a lot to have him, so I could basically say what I want. And I said, this is non-negotiable. If you sack him, you have to pay him his full contract the next day. But normally, you can't say these things because they, they won't take you. <coughs> so you got to as well <coughs> see the temperature of the waters and try to have the common sense help yeah. you. Legal um, skills are always balanced with common sense. So it depends very much how strong is your negotiation position. Also, when I was signing Hulk in China, I was, that's a huge contract the Chinese were, play, were paying. This was one year ago. And I was basically came, coming in, basically saying, OK, I'll leave them any clause they want, I will put, put in. But of course, there are clauses I cannot allow by any chance. Uh, but I didn't require any so guarantee. Have, have you got an example of some of those clauses? Yes. I mean, people ask me now, when they bring a player to China, do you ask for guarantees? Because they're afraid that at the second year, if the player does not perform, that they will not pay him. So I said, no, no guarantees. What you can negotiate is, for instance, it's a four-year term contract. Ask that the last year be divided and put the money in the three firsts, something like that, okay? But it's very difficult for companies to present guarantees. So no, no bank guarantees. But for instance, they had a clause there, which is typically for their culture, not for us, is, I mean, imagine they're paying millions and millions <laughs> per year to a player, and then they put a clause in saying that if you're sick for more than eight days, we can terminate the contract unilaterally, and you're gone. That is totally unacceptable. So that took me one week to negotiate, to take that clause out. So it was hard. But you can never, never accept a clause like that. I mean, when you most need the support of your employer, and if you get a fever, <laughs> you get sacked, it's, it's non-negotiable. And then you can, of course, negotiate and, and help to, to increase the insurance and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But all of the, all the, all of the clauses, I was 
basically willing to, okay, put whatever you want. I just want the dispute to be in the CAS, according to the due process of law. I want disciplinary proceedings to be notified, to be able to respond, and to have an appeal right. I mean, these basic things, which in a country, for, for political and cultural reasons, you don't have, you shift them to Switzerland, and you're fine, I think. Thank you. Mm. You now got me thinking, and I'll, I hope, uh, please entertain me with this question. Could, have you got examples from your own, like you, that was a very interesting to hear about your own <coughs> examples for some of the clauses in a contract from uh, your perspective. What are some of the, I guess, more interesting, either from a, from a legal standpoint or, I guess, unusual clauses you've seen in, in, in contracts? Something you see a lot, for example, are uh, close, clauses regarding low performance. Yeah. Um, so if the player has a low performance, whatever that means, uh, that the club is entitled to, to fire to terminate the, the contract. And, and of course, that is a very abusive uh, clause because it can be used any time and it's completely subjective. So what is a low performance, right? So, and that is seen a lot. Uh, fortunately, the DRC never accepts it, but the DRC is the dispute resolution chamber from FIFA. And uh, players can al only go to the DRC if it's an international dimension, so it's if the player is an international in that club. But for domestic uh, players, it's a very tricky uh, clause that appears a lot and damages uh, a lot of players. Well, that's interesting. I, you know, I know that you do a lot of work and have done uh, particularly on, on performance bonuses, as an example. So is that something you're seeing in terms of, I know clubs are very keen to analyse before they invest into a player. So sort of how they're going to be able to afford to pay them and how, you know, make sure that they're getting rewarded for, for good performances. Yeah, I suppose my position on that is even, you know, I think even in the Premier League, I think clubs don't spend as much time as they should thinking about those issues. I think, um, you know, a lot of clubs still take a very traditional approach that's, that's been, you know, there since the, the, the birth of the Premier League, really, with, with mostly, um, you know, fixed salaries and, and you know, a fairly basic bonus schedule that they don't pay out a huge amount under, um, but which actually can often lead to rows with, within arguments <coughs> with, with the players. And um, it, it always seems to me those bonus schedules, you know, bring no benefit and potentially cause some damages. So I'm very surprised that clubs still use them. And there's only one or two clubs uh, in the Premier League that, that don't use them. Um, I suppose the one that stands out for me is as the least rational or the one that I'm still surprised that you see are goal bonuses. So, um, you know, there are um, two two clubs in the Premier League that still pay really substantial goal bonuses. You know, there's um, one in particular that pays, you know, players can earn half their weekly salary um, or even more sometimes with a ratchet um, based on a goal bonus. And, you know, to me, incentivizing, you know, so the argument is, well, goals are good. Goals help you win matches and winning matches is what we're trying to do and that's how the club earns money. Um, and goals do correlate well with success, but obviously an individual player scoring a lot of goals doesn't necessarily, and, and he may be you know, taking the wrong option because he's got a massive incentive in his, in his contract when he should be passing the ball. Um, so that's a really you know, basic example, but it's one that I'm really surprised to, to still see you know, some sophisticated well, clubs using. There have been occasions, aren't there, where clubs have performed, well, scored lots of goals and still been, <laughs> been relegated. So. Can I just add a point here? I mean, we have now the, the Barcelona Neymar case where they're discussing if the signing bonus is due or not because he just renewed the contract last year or some months ago. And he's, he's demanding that the full signing bonus is paid and they are asking for the money back. So I remember when I came to FC Porto, like, I don't know, 17 years ago, and there was always practice of the club to pay a signing bonus. And many times the signing bonus, of bonus for the player was then shifted to, to the agent or to the father. So similar to this case as well. And I remember, I was not sure. I mean, if this guy earns now one million <coughs> for the signing bonus and next year he's gone, then it's, it's complicated for the club. So I baptized, baptized it at that time, a loyalty bonus. And if it was a four year term contract, I said, okay, we pay you 250 each year and make sure you pay it in September after the summer transfer season and subject of the player being registered with the club. And after two years, the player was gone. It was uh, Diego. <laughs> and so at least we saved there, uh, I think almost seven, 750 because you know, he needed to be yeah. the third term to get the second installment. So these are small details, but if you are 
long enough in a club, you end up automatically thinking about these clauses. And can I come so back a little bit for the global, the global standard contract? I don't think I think that the core of any contract is already in the regulations of FIFA. I mean, the core that was decided. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not saying that is the the best content, <coughs> but I think the, the the core of the rules that must be respected, like for instance that the contract cannot be subject to a validity of a, medical, of, a, medical. A, a, of the healthy condition of the player or of a visa. So you have the core of any global contract, but you cannot avoid that. You have some interpretation under the domestic law. And I go, I'm just giving you an example, maybe for Fifth Pro, it's, it's something to, to think about as something good. And for the clubs, of course, there's, a, there's a, an alert very strong in that in Brazil. <coughs> Recently, we had the first case when we were defending Internacional and Oscar, and he went to be released from Sao Paulo. And he has a decision in first instance at, on the merits. <coughs> he signed with Internacional, and in the end, by a total strange decision, the judge in the second instance sent him back to Sao Paulo. And then was the first time where a habeas corpus was used to release this player to come back to Internacional. We used that in a very, very uh, uh, extraordinary situation because there was no precedent of saying that he was obliged to be training in Sao Paulo's facilities. Since he said, I don't want to play for Sao Paulo, the consequences of this decision would be evaluated in the future if he gave cause to determination or the club. But the fact is that definitely he could not be obliged to be playing or training in another facilities that the one that are not the inters. But recently, for more ordinary situations, habeas corpus are being granted recently. For players that are simply, they don't like, they don't want to be uh, anymore linked to a club, and they are using that, and recently we are facing one case like that against Inter now. The player didn't even file the habeas corpus. And we know that it's an English institution that we Im imported and and uh, we know that the case that someone can file another corpus on behalf of someone is for, is for a situation that there's nothing to do with this situation, which means that not even the player in this, this situation put his face to say, I'm, I want to go. So this is, this is really tricky. And about a very, I think it's a good example of an excess in favor of the club uh, is the Arioza case. Arioza case, it's never been discussed in auditoriums, in, in forums like this. I don't know why. Because it's the, it's the first and only, as far as I know, case before the cast where moral and sporting damage were awarded. Yeah. And uh, the situation there was critical because the player was suffering a cancer and he was simply dismissed by Olympia from Paraguay. Arios is a Uruguayan player, was a top player. He was playing really well in Libertadores that year. And it was a very cruel situation that he suffered there. And the contract, the contract says that in case the club terminates the contract, the club has to pay only the days until the end of the year in course. And the club served the termination on the 30th of December of a, of a, a, a certain year. Okay. Of course, the cast dismissed that. And one thing about that, so this, this, is, a, this is not a way to draft a contract in good faith because you can use that in why in this situation. But what calls the attention is the fact that uh, everybody that analyzes, especially clubs, this decision of, of Ariosa says that the standards were too high. It was so extraordinary the situation that it was granted. And I disagree with that because for me, from a Brazilian culture that, uh, I mean, moral losses is very common there to be awarded. And I think that if a player goes training or goes out to have dinner with his family and come back and the keys are, were changed or he's obliged to train in, in the ice or in situations that are, are not ordinary, I think these situations, all of them, all of them could justify moral losses on behalf of a player. I don't think they are ordinary. You mentioned sporting sanctions and I know that you, you, you yesterday we were talking, you were basically saying, well, the, the, I hope I'm not misrepresenting your view, that you don't think that's been used enough by FIFA, in the sense that the, the you know where there are situations where a player is abu abused in a contractual sense, um, that the club aren't receiving uh, any sporting sanctions, so they may have to pay a settlement. Can I get your your views on that? Mine or I uh, Daniel's first, but then I'll say yours. Yeah. <coughs> no, 
uh, as I read my, my lecture of the of the, the regulation is that once the contract was terminated without just cause by any of the parties during the protected period, it's mandatory to apply sporting sanctions. But we don't see that very often, especially against the clubs. And I think that is, is being more rare against the players also. So, but that, then we are, we are making empty the concept of, of protected period because You're sometimes the sporting sanction... Period. No. Well, yeah, it's, I suppose it's worth, it's it's worth explaining yeah. quickly. I mean, so Article 17 of the FIFA transfer regs uh, provides for a player basically unilaterally terminating a contract. Um, so at any time, a player can w walk away from a contract. Um, if it's within a protected period, which is uh, three years for players under 27, two years for players over 27, then he will receive a sporting sanction and also um, financial compensation. If you're outside the protected period, then it's just financial compensation. Um, but, but the case law hasn't been, as, as, as Daniel said, uh, uniform in, in always applying a sporting sanction. Well, I think one point that is useful, and I think this is an interesting issue, Article 17. So Article 17, these unilateral termination cases, a lot of you will have heard of the Webster case, but it hasn't been used very much. You know, it's been in the regulations since 2002. Um, it wasn't used until Webster. And then because the Webster case and then other cases that, that applied the law in a different way. There was a little bit of confusion as to how it would work. Um, it's pretty settled now that it's market value, basically the compensation. Um, but it seems to me that Article 17 is potentially going to, going to become more important because one thing you know, that's interesting for us to talk about is this summer, and maybe even in the last couple of years, we've seen a little bit of a shift in the dynamic of player power um, that you know, previously a player who really wanted to leave a club seem to be able to find a way to force their way out. And we've seen, you know, this summer, a lot of very high profile cases, you know, Van Dijk, Coutinho, Sanchez, uh, I'm sure there's, there's a few others, um, where players very obviously and clearly wanted to leave a club and weren't able to get out. And the reason they weren't able to get out wasn't because there was an, wasn't another club willing to pay their market value. I think in all of those cases, there were clubs who were willing to pay market value for those players. But it was, it was the, their current clubs exercising their power and saying, you're not going whatever the price. Um, and in cases like that, Article 17, when you know that the compensation that will be awarded is market value, even though you don't know exactly what that number is, I think you could see players being more willing and clubs, uh, you know, the, the, the buying club effectively, being more willing to say, yes, let's use Article 17 and let's, let's see what the compensation is. It's worth it to acquire this player. And what that means is if the protected period becomes more important. So you want to be able to get outside that protected period. And for the younger players, so that's three years. So what you might see is players, you know, because there's been some talk that maybe players will start signing shorter contracts to give them that more power. Because when you're in the last one year, two years of your contract, you have more leverage a little bit. That always, doesn't always work, as we saw this summer. But with, you, you could say similarly that players will be looking to get outside the protected period. So maybe they will sign longer deals still but they won't renew the deals. They won't have this every year, taking an extra 5%, taking an extra 10% to add an extra year because that resets the protected period. Because much like when you're coming to the end of a contract, if you're coming one year away from being outside your protected period, that gives you leverage because you can say to the club, well, look, next summer, I'm outside the protected period. I can serve my Article 17 notice and I can go, notwithstanding that I've got a six-year contract. So I think one trend to look out for, for me, you know, people have talked about shorter contracts, maybe that will happen. I think what, what will happen, or well-advised players will probably not renew their contracts for small bumps um, to keep that leverage of, of the protected period. That's an perspective, but uh, so come back, I want to come on to some, some tax issues and, and some issue, issues around image rights and how they're drafting the contract. Before I do, just on your view on the sort of sporting sanctions against clubs. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, um, that's a, a big issue for us as well in, in Fifth Pro because we uh, see that sporting sanctions, as uh, Daniel was mentioning, um, are applied much, much more on players than on uh, clubs. And now like the sort of uh, decision that FIFA has made, but it's of course not published and it's not official, but it's like in, if in the last two years uh, there are five breaches of the club, then they apply the sanctions. And it's just crazy because as he was mentioning, like this is not what Article 17 states. So if you don't want that in the article, you modify the regulations, but you don't ignore a part and then take the other part that fits you. So um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's a real shame that that happens uh, a lot uh, within the, the regulations, right? It seems, is, is, from your perspective, is there a lot of that sort of customs and norms 
that, that takes place? Because I know there was an issue in Germany around changes uh, with transfer of minors or registration of minors over the transfer window. They had an extension in which all of a sudden they just revoked that extension and they said we're not doing that anymore but they've done it for a few years and then all of a sudden they changed that. Is that something you see within, within FIFA that there is these sort of practices that sort of introduced outside of the regulations to give some some flexibility, but also then create uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think there are, there are many examples, and and also when you ask specifically about it, the the replies are always, of course, quite vague. So as not to, uh, so it's very difficult to know what we are dealing with. So yeah. I really think that we should look into the regulations and try to uh, adapt them, uh, improve them. And, and if there are things that we don't agree with, because the sporting sanctions you might think are too harsh or not, like, okay, that's arguable, but then just change the regulations and don't uh, do as if they did not exist. But to follow up on that point, I think you know, enforcement of regulations is key there as well, because it's all well and good, the, the regulation saying something, but, but unless it's enforced, then um, it's meaningless. And you know, one example I think we can all agree is, you know, uh, that is contrary to, to the player's interest is third party ownership. You know, so third party ownership has been banned um, and, and you know, most people within the industry think that is a good thing. But most that were. ban in, most in, in, were. in the football industry? No, no, outside no. of Brazil in, and Portugal? In, in English, outside in of Brazil England, and Portugal. Industry. Most, okay. Yeah. okay, some of no, us. No, I'm just making. Some I'm of us. Not everyone. No, not agree, 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 yeah. agree, <laughs> agree. Not everyone agrees, but a lot of people agree. Um, <laughs> but there are some countries in which that ban is not being enforced. You know, there is TPO going on, um, and particularly, you know, agents acting as effectively yeah. um, uh, third party you know, owners taking uh, interest in, in, in future transfers. And, you know, clearly that's not happening in England. Um, but uh, you know, I've, I've been surprised to see that it is happening still in other countries, and it is banned everywhere. And it ultimately, there needs to be an appetite for the regulators to, to to regulate. And I think there isn't the appetite in most areas for FIFA to to get involved. And they do rely on the national associations, and a lot of the na national associations don't necessarily care. Can I can I just about that? There's something that I think it's um, it's very interesting to say. Uh, I don't I don't agree that the interpretation. Uh, of the of the ban on on third party is that the player is also a third party on his own transfer, which for me is I cannot understand so can that. You, can you just I explain, that, understand explain that in how any, that works in practice? It, sorry. No. So, so I mean, economic rights uh, third party ownership is the participation of a third party on the future profits of a transfer of a player. It's the most most common uh, way to know that. But for me, the player cannot be considered a third party in his own transfer because is. It's so natural that we had in Brazil a mandatory participation of a percentage in the past, and it still exists in Uruguay and Argentina. In Uruguay and Argentina, I think, I think that is at least 15%. Yeah, 20 in Uruguay. 20 or something, which means that the player under the Argentinian or Uruguayan law is, can, can receive 30% over his transfer. And what's happening? What's happening? That opens the door, to, so you put to recognize to the player, and by another private instrument, the player agrees with a real third party. So this is happening there, and this brings an imbalance in the market, because we cannot do that in Brazil. Of course, there are people doing it in many forms, but I've, I, I, I haven't seen any reaction from FIFA, because it doesn't matter if an Argentinian law provides that. We have many laws in Brazil that provide differently from the regulations. Yeah. But what I mean is that, First of all, the first mistake is to say the player is a third party in regards to his own transfer. It's Can I just add, I totally agree with Daniel. I mean, I was, I was at that time in the working group of FIFA about the third party ownership uh, banning. Or, and, and I think it's uh, the, the reason why FIFA is not, not speaking or investigating or handling this case is because I think they are embarrassed about it. Because, first of all, they, f they de deliberately put aside the player, considering the player in his own transfer a third party ownership. And I mean, FIFA Pro was there, and FIFA Pro didn't, didn't ask for the player to be there. I mean, I did. <laughs> uh, anyway. No, but uh, uh, the FIFA Pro did not agree that the player would be a third party. That no, was no. not agreed by They agreed, FIFA. yeah. I was there. It was a, it, well, it, that's not the official. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. <FIFA. laughs> I, they did, but it's anyway. <laughs> I mean, it was very, very, the whole, the whole working group, I mean, was embarrassing because, I mean, there was not even a transitional period. 
there wasn't what they considered a transitional period was not a transitional period because the, the season was already ongoing anyway. Uh, the problem relies on the fact that officially in some countries, as in Brazil and in Argentina and many other countries in South America, it's still officially included. And also in Portugal, we see it every day. I mean, people who are in football, they do, do business. It's every day there, but under the table. So you have an official uh, prohibition, but it's like the bootleg in, in the 30s or wherever when it was in Chicago. Everybody's is drinking, but so the reality is somewhat different. So to what's actually yeah, it, 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 it's, it's so not, much it's not even entirely regulated. bootleg. That, that, that's what I was surprised <laughs> at. I mean, I knew that people would try and find ways around TPO, and there'd be all sorts of schemes and stuff. Yeah. But there are certain countries where it's just being still done on the face of the contracts, yeah. um, and that's what I was surprised by. I, uh, you know, that it, it's not hidden, it's not underground. It's no, still that's what so we were talking about, right? The enforcement, enforcement. like yeah. Uh, yeah. many many regulations are not being enforced in the countries, mm. even the ones that that according to the RSTP should be enforced directly, like directly apply, because there are two uh, kind of, let's say, uh, regulations within the RSTP. There are ones that have to apply directly to the federations, and some others have to be uh, like the, 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 the nature or the some idea has to be uh, implemented. So, so, so definitely, I think that it should be a matter to be reviewed by FIFA, because the, the, the existing, the present situation is, is, is really not nice. I mean, everything is going on, officially, unofficially, and, and FIFA has these rules, which, first of all, they don't make sense. From the legal point of view, um, there are many, many doubts that, that, that it's lawful. I mean, I think there's in the European court some kind of, of, um, of claim going on, but, but definitely there are some serious doubts legally, and, and from, from a functionality and and uh, point of view, there, there are, there's, doesn't make any sense. So if they want to, if they want to prohibit, maybe let's regulate it, but do it in a sensible way. So, yeah. So what would be the mechanism then? So, so from the consensus on the panel would be then the ban on third-party ownership is is actually not being that effective because in reality it's still going on in the markets where it is most prominent, and the enforcement of it's not really effective. It's so, worse so than before because yeah. now it's in a black market. And if if they would regulate that. The thing is, to be clear, you can have an economic right being generated by many forms. To promise, pay something to someone that brings you a player without money invested. But the classical form is when someone really injects money in, and as a result, if there's a profit on the transfer, then there's a share. I think this economic right specifically should be regulated and put it clearly, yeah. disclose that, in the TMS, in the, in the domestic uh, federations, instead of simply uh, saying that it doesn't exist because the needs keep existing. And I don't, I've never understood uh, really why Fifth Pro, uh, where, where, the, where it affects negatively the player. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, we've but discussed that, me and Daniel, we make <laughs> a lot of efforts, Brazilian clubs, he was there in Brazil, we came here, we went to the Coma Ball. Uh, we made a, a huge fight on that, but the institutions were not on our side, our federations and everything. But I, I never understood why Fifth Proof thinks that this, I mean, this good economic rights could affect the players, because in my point of view, there's more money. A classical example, someone that has money goes to a small club that cannot have 20, 40, 50 players and sponsors that with this money so you have places for 50 possible professionals in the future. So uh, I honestly didn't I, understand I, that. See, I think but we've already touched on the reason though, you know, uh, without getting into the rights or wrongs of, you know, regulation of TPO, so you can have good TPO and not bad TPO, mm -hmm. versus a ban. So without getting into, you know, my views on that, but even if you believe that regulation is the way to go, for regulation to work, there needs to be enforcement. And we've already discussed, yeah, yeah. Exactly. you know, there are yeah, so sure. many different areas where enforcement, even yeah. of what we already have, is not working. So if we can't rely on the enforcement of, and, re and regulation of TPO would require a huge amount of, 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 of effort to, to properly enforce, then we just need to ban it. I agree, and I, I, yeah. you know, that was it's, very, it's very important what you just said, in my view, because if you have a good law, I think you have also 
you have more courage to make the enforcement and to investigate and to monit monitorize it. As they did it, FIFA, by absolutely banning it, I think they are almost ashamed because they're doing every everywhere. It's, kind of, it's everywhere. So I don't think where they, they will start. Shall we have find a scapegoat and begin with Brazil or with Portugal? For instance, just now in this transfer season, I saw a player didn't move, he wanted to move in his last year because the club had only 30% of the so-called economic rights. So for the club, the coach wanted to keep him and the club said, okay, fine, because we only have 30%, we will lose him next year, but we don't care because we will only receive 30%. And I think if it, this would be regulated, and we talked about it at that time, uh, we, we say, is it 50% that, that the third party can have? Is it less than that? We could find a balance so the sporting side of, of the competition and of the player would be protected as well. And I think it's important not only to have a good regulation, but to enforce it. But it comes together. If, for instance, like in Portugal, you have a rule that says in the highway you cannot, you cannot have a, you have a speed limit of 120 kilometers per hour when with the new cars, it's ridiculous, you will fall asleep. Yeah. So with good, <laughs> with good highways and, and, and modern cars, you will fall asleep. So nobody enforces it, but then, then you have to find a balance. So let's change the law and let's enforce it. So, so Alexander, it's only fair that <laughs> so, it's a bit of a bashing in terms of the FIFA uh, uh, representation on the third party ownership. Do you want to reply or just, are you just, it's up to you? Well, it's just like, um, yeah, we, we agree on, on, on the banning of TPO because we see a lot of uh, 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 consequences on the players because let's like, just to make it a little bit uh, yeah general uh, because the players are were not uh, they were not being transferred where they wanted to or how they wanted to they were being moved around uh, by the will of this uh, third party so their their will was not being respected because sometimes players didn't even know uh, how many entities or which entities were owing their economic uh, uh, rights uh, because there was a lot of this money from football that was going out of football to these uh, companies and we think that it's better that it's kept with the players. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to, to mention is that, of course, maybe what you might have in mind right now are the Neymars, the Messis, the Suarez, the, you know, all the greats, the Ronaldos, but uh, just to uh, so that you bear in mind that 45% of the players worldwide, and this is a study that we have made, so it's uh, really with the University of Manchester, it's not our opinion, earn less than $1,000 per month. And 21% of all the amount, not of the, of the 45, 21% of the 100 earn less than $300 per month. And that is the reality. So uh, most of these things that we're talking about have more consequences on all this big amount of players than on the top stars, right? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the floor for questions. But the, uh, I think it's a really good point because I think you know, in sport, in football, and in most other sports as well, we see all the successes and the pinnacles and the, the Neymar deals and so forth. We forget about the umbrella of people dipping in and dipping out all the time, particularly the players. Um, we've got a whole bunch of issues that we haven't even touched on, <laughs> so apologies to the panelists. Can I make a provocation? Just uh, one for Alexandra. You see the paradox. Just one thing. You see the paradox. Just one thing. Be democratic with me. Just one thing. A paradox. This interest that moves a player from a place to another that concerns in terms of economic rights exists only in the big cases. The economic rights for the 70 or 45% and 21 give them the chance to, to play in some, some, somewhere. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna have to, you can see why Daniel's I a very good advocate. No, it's, <laughs> he just bashes people. I could follow up, but it's okay. <laughs> but the, uh, it makes clubs uh, dependent. So it's only well. fair. Actually, I are there any uh, particular favor. questions, Daniel? Are there <laughs> any particular questions uh, from the floor? Does everyone just want to go? <laughs> it's that, that enthralling. Um, any questions? No? Oh, oh, okay, right. Uh, gentleman at the front, and then the second row. If you can say your name and organization, please. Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is Andreas. Uh, I am a lawyer from Anderson Tax and Legal. And I will ask them uh, for their opinion, because uh, some, and they are talking uh, a lot about the uh, financial problems that the clubs can have uh, because of the TPO banning. Uh, 
in this case, uh, they say that the, that uh, third party ownership is a big part of the um, financial uh, income of the, of the club. And they are proposing some uh, alternative options, uh, like, for example, uh, the emission of bonds and uh, the possibility that the uh, third parties can take a part in the club and not the player. Uh, what do you think about that alternatives? Uh, do you think that could uh, that could be an option to uh, replace the third party ownership on uh, the players uh, rights? Okay. So, 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 okay, sorry, I'm just going to disappear just for time yes. to give the gentleman a chance. Uh, so what, what do you think about alternatives to TPO? A quick, it can be quick fire, that'd be great. No. Okay, I, I understand the bonds part, the second part I didn't understand. Can you just uh, clear that, please? Which was, yeah. all right, but uh, alternative. Uh, alternative financial products, right? Yes, so. I, mean, uh, I mean, and th that uh, companies or <coughs> any other party to take a part in, in the interest of the club and not directly in the interest of the player. Uh, by uh, uh, assuming part of the debts of the club, for example. I mean, you can be creative, but at, at the end, if if you're receiving um, if receiving a part of the of the transfer revenue of the player, you're still gonna end up um, doing third-party ownership. Uh, I mean, then you can shift to club ownership as well, which f apparently for FIFA is fine. So, <laughs> so I mean, you can be creative, uh, you know, uh, instead of also um, establishing a, a percentage, certain percentage, you can, you can do it from amounts, from uh, if the player is sold from 1 million to 5, you get X, Y, and you put fixed amounts, and you can make a cascade. You can be creative, you can make bonds, you can make whatever you, you you find will be a will be a uh, an attractable product for the investor, but at, at the end of the, the day, you got to be careful because if if you received um, uh, uh, if if you link it to the transfer of the player, mm. you're still gonna end up being in the third party ownership uh, well, territory. E even there, there, there's a difference from country to country as well. So the yeah. types of security, the types of security you can exactly. grant over finance. Yeah, exactly. um, when you're loaning the clubs that you can do in Spain or Portugal, you can't do in this country, for example. So yeah. it's not just the FIFA ban, but each national association have introduced, you know, a number of national associations have introduced their own rules. So it does. Uh, the security chambers and exchange chambers will have also to, to verify and, 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 and uh, give their, their okay to, to those operations. Yeah. And again, we come back to the, the, the enforcement issue. There's a lot of people doing, there are clubs that are following the rule and not doing. And, uh, yeah. mm. I know, I know there were definitely people looking at investing in squads. Like as soon as the ban came out, you heard that there was various funds to do that. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, gentlemen. Good afternoon. My name is Murtala from Nigeria. I wanted to make a quick comment and then ask a question. Um, if you can keep the comment brief, that would be great. Okay, great. Uh, on the third party ownership, I mean, if you look at uh, where I'm from, Nigeria, I think that it's going to exist for a while because uh, of the poverty level there. I agreed uh, a lot of the players are uh, negotiating from an unfair advantage point, and, but they jump into it because really it's the bridge for them to um, progress in that career. So I think that would continue for a while. But I wanted to touch on the specifics of um, the contract situation between uh, Diego Costa and Chelsea. And of course you talked about uh, protected um, period for the players and what have you so, but I was wondering um, so Diego Costa now um, says um, he doesn't want to move to which uh, Chelsea wants to send him to a different club but he wants to go back to Atletico of course I know maybe, maybe his contracts would have stipulate penalties for those kind of breaches but if Chelsea now wants him to play with the reserved or that's the gist. Can he as a player say, look, I'm a professional. I cannot play with the reserves because they don't play on a professional level. I mean, as lawyers, how, how would you advise him? Who, who wants to take that? Um, I. <laughs> um, well, from the player's perspective, right? If we, if we think about the player's rights and the right to work and the right of freedom and all the uh, uh, then I would say that, of course, he could walk out. But the problem is that the consequences that he may face, right? Um, 
that's one of the things that was, was mentioned before. I don't remember who mentioned it, but uh, it's, oh yeah, uh, Daniel did. Um, that it's really important to insert in the contract like for, for which uh, team the player is going to, to play. Because in, in, if it was stated that the player was going to play for the main team, then it, everything is much clearer. So it's better to do it that way. In this case, I think it could be easily argued that uh, a player of that of that size was not hired to play in the in the reserve team, but still it can lead to a lot of trouble. To uh, yeah, a, a complaint before the DRC that will probably be a, uh, appealed to CAS, and that takes years, and that also uh, makes it really difficult for the player to find a new club because the new club will be joined uh, and severally liable yeah. Yeah. for the amount to be paid. And that is such a big burden to carry for the yeah. players. So it's, it's a very delicate issue. I entirely agree. I think the problem, the big, I think one thing is that uh, there's another con kind of contracts that you also can provide that, that if the club is relegated, the player is also free. Big players when they live, especially in Germany, is a very common to put that in the contracts. Lucio from the Brazilian national team has this clause and they, but I think that when, when the player is sent to player with the reserves because he's not well technically, this is something that I think the club can do and it's a proper manner to, to deal with the contract. That is fair. But when the club does that, just to put pressure on the player to force him to go, then I think that he has on the merits reason to terminate the contract with just cause. But as Alexander says, it's going to be very difficult to find another club that accepts to share or to jointly uh, respond by the risk. Anyone else on that? Or? Anyone else on that? Uh, okay. Just one agreement. Just the strongest possible one new agreement. comment. <laughs> meant to you. One agreement. No, only two. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Francisco. Uh, I'm glad we're all having a great afternoon and it's been a spicy and energetic uh, debate. You mentioned briefly image rights and I've heard a lot of conversation on TPO. And let's go to a specific example on Cristiano Ronaldo where his lawyer comes and says it's a question of interpretation. So I'd like to see FIFA's view on it and also a legal view on it uh, around image rights and uh, what can we expect on next stages of this discussion. Okay, so, so the question would be really where are we going to see image rights go? Is our FIFA going to yeah. uh, essentially grab the nettle? Well, I think with image rights, so the, I mean, the position has changed a lot in, in, in recent years. And we've, we've kind of had a situation now in Europe. England is pretty much the only country where, where we see club image rights deals done anymore. So, you know, um, Germany and France was pretty good anyway. I mean, Spain, it was pretty common and then the legislation changed and it doesn't happen so much anymore. Um, and in... Um, I think France have just uh, implemented a law, though, in which they can uh, earn the player contracts for image rights now. Percentage. Allowing it? Yeah, yeah. OK, right, right. Well, previously it was prohibited. And, and, and Italy, again, you, you don't really see it. So it actually gave a bit of an advantage to the English clubs. And, and it, um, so what's happened in England, in the, for the last three years, as, as, as Francisco will know better than most people, but it, there was a, basically a, um, an agreement in place between the Premier League clubs and HMRC that a set percentage of revenue of salary could be paid as image rights. And provided you stayed within those parameters, then um, both at a club level and a player level, then the HMRC didn't get involved. Um, and that agreement ended this summer. So ne we're now in a period where they've issued a new set of guidelines. And the new guidelines basically just say, um, there's no agreed level, you just have to be commercial. Um, so there has to be a real link between what you're paying as image rights and um, the, um, the rights your, your, the club is receiving and how the club exploits those rights. So we've, we've got a bit more uncertainty here. I think um, you know, we, we, we will still see image rights being used. Um, you know, there's one piece, uh, there's one court case in this country which, which kind of sets the foundation for the legitimacy of image rights. And I think when you think about it, clearly these players are big stars. They receive a lot of money for uh, personal endorsements. So you know, it's it's right that a club can use that image to generate revenue through its own endorsements, and you know it, it, it makes sense. But clearly, there has been abuse in the past. I think there's a little bit of an extra uncertainty. It's probably good news for lawyers to some extent because you don't have those set percentages. So now, clubs really have to take proper advice. They have to put the proper structures in place, and they do need um, probably help steering through to ensure that they're not a sitting target for HMRC. It seems on that analysis, I know this is the domestic though, but it seems like even if you did all the modelling, so you, you, you hire a firm, you do all the modelling, and it's a bad investment, right, and the player doesn't come off, that you could still be getting a bit of trouble. Like if you, you know, the, essentially the image rights structures are based on the fact that you are going to commercialise in the future. Yeah. But you can see that being retrospectively a problem if someone 
you know you don't you don't actually achieve what you thought you were going to achieve you can see that being quite uh, yeah i mean the key is the commerciality at the time the agreement was entered into so provided your your basis is based on you know fair assumptions you know if the player ends up being not quite as good as you thought or breaks his leg then you know, I think HMRC would, would struggle to take action against you for that. And, and the, the other panellists, what do you think about image rights just generally in terms of you know, evading or avoiding tax um, or being beneficial or not to the player or club or agent? Uh, yeah, well, we, we have seen uh, a lot, uh, especially cases going to the DRC where there are double uh, contracts and, and there was in a certain uh, time a lot of uh, doubts were like uh, because many um, football associations say like now we only accept one contract and the contract that is registered uh, so these image rights that were not image rights contract that were not uh, registered were could not be presented uh, in the claim before the, the DRC but the DRC decided that um, in most of these cases, of course, you have to look at uh, the specific case, uh, but these image rights contracts were actually um, only a disguise and they were putting part of the salary in these image rights contracts uh, only to avoid, as you were saying, uh, tax payment of taxes, etc. So, uh, and this was normally decided by the club and the club just presented both contracts and told the player, okay, you have to sign here, you have to sign here. And um, uh, the player did, and of course, players should be uh, more instructed and do things right. But the truth is that it was really coming like from the employer's side. So it, it couldn't be used against the player. So normally a DRC does accept uh, the two contracts as part of the salary, because they say it's, it's mm. salary that is being disguised. In the same line in Brazil, the, the, uh, it was very prejudicial to the player because there, are, there were some clubs in the past, the first division of the Brazilian football, that put 80% in yeah. image rights and 20 on salary. And the uh, consequence of that is that the Brazilian law uh, says that if, if there's any overdue payment in regards to salaries or something for, for 90 days, not three months, but 90 days, then the player can simply uh, ask for a preliminary injunction and go. But it, it was not recognized the same consequence to the image rights mm. contracts. Now the law was changed and also image rights, when they're not paid, the player mm. can use the same scape. And, the and sorry, the, the amount paid for social security as well, just brackets, yeah. sorry. The, the one other point to pick up just from Francisco's question though, uh, Ronaldo, who, because what he did get into it, difficulty with was in relation to the offshore rights. Yeah. And um, so that is one change we've seen in the last six months, I think in this country, HMRC, so previously non-domiciled, um, non so players who were resident here but not domiciled here were using dual structures with an English company and an offshore company um, and HMRC accepted that but that is one area that where they've, they've changed their approach I think in the last six months and the use of, of offshore companies now or you know, overseas companies for the foreign rights is coming under scrutiny so what you could do is seeing um, because what they say is that once the rights of you know once the, the the club has generated the money it's coming to the uk now it's saying it's being paid back outside the uk then it's, it's within the uk tax net but what you could see is clubs so you could see you know a fordham international being set up in uh, uh the bvi or cayman and that all offshore international revenues that clubs generate doesn't come into the uk it actually stays offshore um because clubs are generating you know millions and millions of pounds internationally there's no reason that it, it should necessarily come um, and it stays offshore. And then if the, uh, the image rights contracts with the foreign companies are paid using the international companies, then it com never comes into the UK tax net. So that's one thing that's I could see happening. So did you want anything to yeah, add on that? Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, everything was, was, was said, but it's obvious, obviously a request that comes from the club who is trying to reduce its tax burden towards the, the, the player's remuneration. So my advice is that players should really be careful. There should be a link that sh should be a, a really small percentage and the best would be to try to avoid it but uh, and make sure that if there are some tax liabilities the burden um, falls for the club and not for the player. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the tax authorities as global, like, you know, particularly in Europe anyway at least, are getting much more aggressive and it's great at headlines for them so politically I think yeah. it adds up to their favour. We've got one final question from the floor and I'll be given the signal and the lights are flashing that we need to go before the stage blows up. Hi, my name is Andre. Um, I just would like to ask a question about uh, Coutinho's contract. Uh, basically, last year he signed a new contract, and suddenly this year he handed it in a transfer request to Barcelona and to Liverpool. And Liverpool said, no, you have no price. I just would like to know what kind of benefits you might get in a contract without a close, because it's a risk. Now he's not happy, 
he wants to move, but he has contract until 2022. If Liverpool say no, I'm not going to sell you. So what kind of a benefits do you have to sign a contract without a close? Who is you? So, so yeah, so player. Who, who are you talking about? I mean, and the player, the benefits oh. for the player. Yeah, benefits for the player, uh, yeah. So, so, so I, mean, I, was, we've, I wasn't quite clear on that question. The question I, I, being... I, I, yeah. I mean, why, I think you're asking, why would a player sign a contract like that without a release clause? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's different from country to country, you know, and obviously in Spain, every player has, a, has a, an automatic buyout clause. Uh, you know, the market standard in England is you don't have release clauses or buyout clauses, but, you know, we, we've spent a bit of time talking about Article 17. So Article 17 does effectively provide, uh, you know, a, a type of buyout right for every player, provided you get outside the protected period. So with someone like Coutinho, if he signed a new contract last year, then um, in another, uh, well, another two years, uh, he'll have, uh, you know, uh, the potential to just walk away. And that will give him some increased leverage probably next summer if he raises the issue again with his club. I think the, the answer for me is really easy. <laughs> when you negotiate a contract, you negotiate many issues. And at a certain point, he accepted that because he received something really good in, <laughs> in another part of the contract. So it's easy. Yeah. When this level of player, talking about a that level of player, not speaking about Correct. a player that earns like thousand reais and has to accept anything to eat. So at this level, that's why, because the other conditions were worthwhile for him. For sure. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up, we'll, please can we just give uh, a warm round of applause for the panelists and for you for asking such great questions. Thank you. Okay. Just, the, only thing I was, oh, the only thing I was just going to add to that was just that quite clearly it seems that the contract is less of an issue if you've got access to good lawyers and the, the, the system in which you operate within is a bigger problem. But anyway, that was it. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon and rest of the convention.